Good evening, Fright Fiends. Tis I, Erlik the Gorlord. A god to some, a devil to others, but a film buff to all. And I welcome you back to my infernal lair on this cold and this stormy winter's eve to peel back the cobwebs and peer into the mausoleum of horror. I also invite you to like and subscribe if you find this content enjoyable, and please share these ghastly videos. I tell you, mortals, this storm is something of a terror, a dark drab rain, which reminds me of an old B-movie favorite of mine, a cult classic if ever there was one. Join me now as I slice into a long-lost bit of B-movie greatness, one that we're quite fond of around here. Robert Fust's darkly sinister contribution to satanic cinema, The Devil's Reign. during the period between the end of Star Trek the television show and the making of Star Trek the motion picture, 1975's The Devil's Reign is one of many B-movies that William Shatner made appearances in. The film also features the legendary Ernest Borgnine as well as Tom Skerritt, Eddie Albert, and a then-rookie actor named John Travolta. Shatner stars as Mark Preston, who we first meet coming home to his mother, played by veteran actress and director Ida Lupino. Apparently, he has been out in a terrible storm looking for his father. Somehow, despite the horrid downpour, high winds, thunder, lightning, and lack of umbrella, Mark doesn't have so much as a drop of water on him. But then again, it's William Shatner, Captain Kirk. So who dare apply such things as physics to a man of such greatness? Poppycock. Anyway, Mark comes home to his mother and John, an elderly hobo of a man whose role in the family is left unclear. It is never stated if John is a cousin, an uncle, a neighbor, or an employee, which, based on his age and pace, uh, would have been quite the poor choice for a household servant. But again, let's not get bogged down by science or sense with this one. Mark's search for daddy has come up empty, but before we can garner any further details, there's a disturbance outside, and it seems that Pops has found his way towards home after all. They race outside to find him babbling about an unnamed book and someone named Corvus, and oh, did I mention that he no longer has eyes? and that upon finishing his babble, he melts into the rain. The same rain that he had been walking through for some time. Uh, Make sense to you? Eh, me neither. Let's move on, shall we? Everyone but the little melty man make their way back home, and Mother retrieves a strange book from a hole in the floorboard. Mark decides that he must take the book and deliver it to this Corbus. It is then that Mother produces some sort of protective amulet, and in typical Shatner style, Canada's greatest thespian export brings it home like nobody can. 
The book's not ours to bargain with. Oh, please take it. No. We won't give the devil's man what he wants. Your father My father would agree with me. Despite seeing his dad, Steve, melt into a pile of liquid latex outside, Mark and the others did not believe the man they encountered to be their loved one. So at the first sound of an approaching vehicle, they determined that Daddy is finally home. He's here. It's the truck. Because all of this makes sense, of course. Mark leaves for literally 55 seconds, long enough to find a voodoo doll in Daddy's ride, and comes back to find his house torn asunder, a missing mother, and a tattered hobo uncle, cousin, neighbor, employee, beaten to shit, strung upside down, and left for dead. Which is, of course, why he then walks the house with no intent, uncovers the amulet from the hole in the floorboard, the same hole that he had placed the book in and never recovered, but, uh... Anyway, he leaves John to bleed out with the amulet in tow and forgets the book. Oh well, it's Shatner, baby. Rather than tend to the dying hobo and leaving at daybreak, Mark does something else until sunrise and then paces a parking lot for several minutes before fishing out the amulet, putting it on, Dramatically, of course, and driving into the morning towards the town of Redstone. After an exhausting travel montage that lasts about one sixteenth of the film's runtime, Mark finally arrives in the ghost town of Redstone, where he meets the cowboy, Curtis. How's your wiener, Pee Wee? Uh, I mean, Corvus, played by the incomparable Ernest Borgnine whose eyebrows take up so much of the screen they should have gotten their own fucking title credit. <sighs> Words are exchanged, dicks are measured, and challenges are issued, resulting in... Corvus! I'll face whatever you have behind those doors and come out exactly as I went in. Shatner, baby. After wagering his eternal soul, Mark is led to an old church where he sees a group of worshippers preparing for ceremony. Hooded and cloaked, we know not as behind any veil, but Mark soon discovers that Corvus is not only their leader, but his beloved mom is part of the cursed cult, sporting black eyes and lots of latex. What does he do? What would any good Shatner do? He interchangeably shoots Christmas colors into one of the cult members and then runs for his life. But neither the rays of the sun nor the amulet are any match for Corvus and his evil eyebrow devil magic. And he disarms Mark the way any good magician should. Present thyself to him. Behold! Then the chase is on. Only it's short-lived and well. Shatner, baby. It is then we meet Mark's doctor brother Tom, played by Tom Skerritt, who apparently got real fucking stoned before filming this scene. We also meet Tom's wife, Julie, played by Joan Prather, a human guinea pig of sorts, uh, taking part in some sort of ESP psychic sleep study, and oh, come on, are you expecting fucking Spielberg? Julie has a panicked vision of Corbus's cult, just as Tom has passed some sort of note confirming he needs to head over there and track his family down. I know, I know. Shut up. Before heading to Redstone, Tom stops to speak with the local sheriff, played by screen great Keenan Wynn, who despite what Hobo John had to say, blames the missing Preston clan and the tattered house on... the fucking storm. Well, look at the inside of your house. It's a shambles. You think a storm did that, Sheriff? Yes, I do. Tom and Julie finally head to Redstone as Mark is made into a bit of a living flesh offering for the group. 
but not before being asked about the whereabouts of the book. Where is the book? You gambled and you lost. Bastard. It turns out, despite having been beaten to a pulp, Hobo John was able to secure the book. Of course, uh, he lets Tom and Julie leave before going to retrieve it, but we'll chalk that one up to his recently acquired traumatic brain injury and not shit for brains riding or a rushed underfunded production. Tom and Julie arrive in town and spend several minutes finding no one. It even takes them a good while once inside the church to see the signs of devil worship. Despite the stained glass and altar and baphomet and... Yeah. Then without warning, their car is blown up. They're almost run over and they then chase the limber-legged assailant into some sort of abandoned hotel or possibly a whorehouse. Where they spend a few more minutes looking around. That is, before a certain someone comes out of the closet. Julie uses her psychic powers to gaze into the eyes of the soon-to-be disco-dancing Scientologist. By the fire in your eyes. And she is then transported back in time or into the satanic version of M. Night Shyamalan's The Village. It turns out that Corbus was alive long ago, and that the Preston ancestors are actually the Fife clan. I know. Thou art the one. Slut! After doing his best Rick James impression, Corbus let Shatner, who is playing Martin Fife at this point, know that it was his wife who had betrayed the cult and absconded with the book. Taken by mob to the stake, he curses the Fife clan for generations to come. Okay. Tom and Julie flee, but Tom has second thoughts. He arms himself and sends Julie onward towards safety. But it turns out Julie is not alone. Mother is with her, and it's time for a little off-road action. The cult moves its operation from the church to a canyon, because budget restraints hadn't gotten completely out of control and they conjure the great Satan himself. And fuck the law! No, not that one. This one. Who calls me from out of the pit? At this point, we see that Tom has infiltrated the group, and we then get to see the high priest and founder of the Church of Satan. Anton Zandor LeVay get his SAG card with this one line. It has. And it's time for more voodoo. And of course... <laughs> Shatner, baby. Once purified by fire and water, Mark becomes like his beloved mom and... Wait... Nah... Anyway, Tom's cover is soon blown, and somehow Mum has made it back without so much as a scratch. I know, I know. But Tom has a shotgun that shoots Christmas colors too. Although, as his shots grow in numbers, the red looks more like poo poo pudding, but then again, shut up. There are gunshots, some running, even a bit of fighting. But Tom escapes into the night, and the following morning he goes to see his partner from back at the lab, Dr. Sam Richards, played by Eddie Albert. For some reason, rather than giving the book to Tom and Julie the previous day, John the Hobo had given it to Sam. Now, how John knows Sam is yet another mystery, but again, let's not apply logic and reason here. 
Sam has to explain to Tom that the book is sort of uh, Corvus's little satanic registry, uh, Hell's guest book, if you were. Uh... As Tom and Sam both head to Redstone with the book, it turns out Corvus now has Julie out of the canyon, and that she is to be sacrificed. While Corvus and Julie play psychic chess, Tom and Sam find an object buried in the floorboards in the old church. The Devil's Reign. A dark and devilish uh, housing project for the souls of Satan. And of all the fancy television sets in the fucking world. <sighs> anyway. For some strange reason, or because they were running out of money, the cult is bringing Julie back to the church to finish the ceremony. The one they started at the canyon. Uh, Tom and Sam leave the book sitting at the altar, and soon after, Mr. Saturday Night Fever has retrieved the book and given it to Corbus. And that's when all hell breaks loose. Tom gets captured, Sam reveals himself, and then... Nah. Will Julie be sacrificed? Will Shatner and Mom get their eyes back? Will Corvus use his magic eyebrows to wreak yet more havoc? Will LeVay say anything else? What is the Devil's Reign? At what point does Travolta get put back in the closet? Obviously there's a lot to be desired when it comes to this film, so to watch it from any deep analytical perspective is about as useful as testing a new cheese grater on your nipples. There's no depth, no terrific scares, even hell, there's barely a plot. But, The Devil's Reign is very 1970s, very B-movie, and, well, it's fun. Even though it suffered from poor writing, massive budgetary constraints, a lot of filler, campy special effects, and more plot holes than a Tommy Wiseau film, it is well shot, and it has more than a few standout moments, and, uh, of course, not to mention that it is loaded, and I mean overflowing with... Commerce! God damn you! Shatner, baby. All in all, I give this silly little slice of satanic cinema two and a half out of five Shatner challenges. I am Merlick the Gore Lord. And I'll be seeing you all sooner or later. Stop with us, this is